Are you saved? Welcome to this new five minute Bible study video series on the topic of salvation. I'm gonna be taking you through four very basic studies on this subject that is gonna teach you what you need to do to be saved and to verify it for you that you are saved. This is actually the product of some studies that I developed several years back when studying with people for the first time about the gospel. They either had an improper view of the gospel or they just didn't know what the gospel was. And so I now use these studies whenever I'm trying to lead somebody to salvation. If you think that you're already saved and you don't need to hear what is about to be presented, I challenge you to stick on and see if maybe this will challenge your understanding. Maybe you want to share the gospel with a friend of yours or somebody that you meet at work. On the link of every video, I will put a Google Drive link where you can download the word for word notes and then you can take those, study them, and share them the same message of the gospel with the person that you have in mind. One thing that I can promise you is that there will be scripture for everything said in this study. The first study I'm going to take you through is called Apologizing for Faith. Step one, wake up and see how much you need Jesus. Step two, get that black gold and make way to your happy place. Step three, read the life-giving Word of God and realize, hey, I could use some help understanding this. Step four, head to the mailbox to get the answer to your problem. Step five, start the six lesson course that takes you all the way from introducing the Bible to answering the question, what must I do to be saved? This course is completely free and can be taken by mail or entirely online through tncgchurchofchrist.org. Upon completion of the course, I'll personally send you a copy of this book, Muscle and the Shovel. That's one book per applicant while supplies last. All you have to do is click in the description link of this video, sign up form, to get started. What are you waiting for? So let's get going on the study about apologizing for faith. This is really a study to take us through the very basics of what faith is, and really more specifically what saving faith is. There is so much confusion. I, mean, I can't overstate enough how much confusion there is on this subject as it relates to the scripture. So hopefully by the end of this, you'll understand what are some false concepts of faith and you will have a proper definition, working definition of saving faith. The first verse I wanna take you through and to show us why this is so important is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. A verse that every Christian needs to at least be familiar with, whether you can quote it or not. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, the Bible says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense for the reason of the hope that lies within you. And there's two words here that you need to understand. It's the word defense, which comes from a Greek word called apologion, which you can hear how we get the word apology from that. And then another word is the reasons for the hope that lies within you. The reasons being the word logos, another Greek word. These two words is where I get the title for this study, Apologizing for Faith. When I talk about apologizing for faith, I don't mean that we need to tell people, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you for teaching the gospel. No, that's not what we're talking about. The word apology used to mean to give a defense. And so we need to be able to give a defense kindly and gently of, for the reasons, the logos. That's what logos means. It means reasons or arguments that lend to a rational conclusion for belief. And so we always need to be ready, like Peter said, to give reasons, evidence for the faith that lies within us. And that's where we'll start, is giving reasons for our faith. A lot of people have very poor reasons for why they believe what they believe. Improper motivations. I'm going to take you through four just really quick. And I believe that these four categories really encapsulate just about anybody you're going to come across that has the improper reason for believing in Jesus Christ. 
The first reason is that they, they being people, have been told something their entire life. And the more you hear something, the more you're going to believe it. There's actually one quote. It's an anonymous author, as far as I am aware of. And he said, it's a lot easier to believe a lie you've been told a thousand times than to believe the truth that you've only been told one time. And that's so true. The volume that you hear something in, and that is not just how loud you hear it, but how many times you are told something as truth, you're going to believe it a lot more so than the minority that you rarely ever hear. So you can see how that's an improper motivation. Another one that's very closely related to it is uh, people believe something because that's what their parents believed. Either because they just simply like heritage for the sake of heritage's sake, or because, you know, their parents are right about how to change the oil in the car. They're right about the recipe for great chocolate chip cookies or whatever. And so they must be right about what they believe in Jesus Christ. And so they're not believing it because there's good reasons for it. There's good logos for it, because, but because their parents simply believe it and they're going to believe it. That's not a good motivation. And I'll give you a story, a really good story from the book Muscle and a Shovel, which is actually advertised in the ad that I just ran. Um, there's a story in there about cutting off the end of the ham. And you may have heard of this before. This man and woman were at Thanksgiving. They were married. And this wife was hosting Thanksgiving for the first time. So she's in the kitchen with her husband. He's helping her prepare the ham. And she takes a knife and cuts off the end of the ham, like a third of this ham. Perfectly good. And the husband's just, <gasps> why did you do that? And she says, what do you mean why did I do that? He's like, why did you cut off a third of a perfectly good ham? And she said, well, because my mom always did it. And he said, call her in here. And so she calls her in here and she says, mom, why did you always cut off the end of the ham at Thanksgiving when you were preparing it? And she thought to herself, well, uh, because my mom always did it. And so they call on grandma and said, grandma, why did you always cut off the end of the ham? And she said, well, back in my day, I only had a pan that was yay big and the ham hung over it. So I had to cut it off so I could fit it in the oven to bake it. And you can see the ludicrousness behind keeping that tradition going. There's maybe good reason for the initial generation to do it. But because the children did what the parents did, just because the parents did it, there was no good reason. Bad, uh, perfectly good ham rather, was wasted in the process. And just like that, with faith, with religion, people believe improperly because their parents believe in it, either for the sake of heritage's sake or because they must be right, because they're my parents. A third improper motivation for faith is putting faith in your pastor, as they're called today, uh, preacher, uh, elder of the church, uh, priest, whoever, because they have authority, because they have studied a lot. Maybe they've been to seminary or something. And I'll just tell you honestly, they're not all preaching the same thing. And if they're not all preaching the same thing, that means they can't all be right. And so maybe we shouldn't put our faith in a religious expert just because he's been to seminary or just because he has a title or a seat of authority or whatever. There are people with authority, with expertise that are wrong all the time. Just watch the news. The fourth motivator that's improper for why we believe what we believe is that Unfortunately, it, it suits people's lifestyle to believe certain things. And if you bring somebody to the pr brink of being saved, I've heard this before. I'm not even joking. They'll say, I'm not going to obey the gospel because if I do that, then I'm going to have to change this about my life. And I don't want to. <laughs> For some people, it's partying on the weekends. They like the bottle. They like sleeping with their girlfriend, and they don't want to change that stuff. They like using foul language. It makes them cool at work or whatever. That is a, the worst reason for believing what you believe, and hopefully that describes nobody here. Now let's get into talking about the definition defining what is saving faith. And in order to do that, I like to start off talking about doubt. Doubt is the opposite of faith. Doubt over here faith over here. So let's talk about that for just a moment. In Matthew chapter 14 and verse 31, Jesus is calling Peter to walk on the water and come to him, have faith in him. And Peter gets out on the water. Initially, he has full trust in Jesus and he starts walking, but then he looks down 
and he starts to sink. And Jesus reaches out, grabs him out, and says, Oh, you of, and I'm quoting, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? There, the phrase doubt and faith are used in the same sentence, and it tells us they're polar opposites of one another. To not have faith is to doubt the thing that is under consideration. Now, you can have a little bit of faith, or you can have a lot of faith. And what I'm going to do here is show you a chart of a continuum of faith. I've actually used this chart and given part of this presentation in another video on our YouTube page. But look at this right here. Having faith is a matter of degree. And if your doubt outweighs your faith, then you are going to not act on whatever the thing is under consideration. If you have more faith than you have doubt, and we'll just talk about Jesus Christ in this example, if you have more faith in Jesus than doubt in him, then you're going to walk on the water, so to speak. When the rubber meets the road, if your faith outweighs your doubt, whether it's 60, 40, 70, 30, 100, 0, more faith than doubt, when the rubber meets the road and it comes down to it, am I going to obey Christ and the situation is presented to you, you will act on it. You will obey if your faith outweighs your doubt. I'm not saying that every saved Christian has 100% faith all the time. Sometimes you go through valleys and sometimes your faith wavers. But hopefully it never wavers to where it outweigh, where your doubt rather outweighs your trust in Jesus Christ. Because if it does, that's where you start to sin and fall away. And so this just gives us a little background, a little basis to help us to go into the proper definition of faith. So that's actually what we're going to do now. There are four components to what I call a saving faith. And I'm very particular about how I say that. Not just faith, but a saving faith. So let's get into those now. The word faith comes from the Greek word pistuo. And I'm not teaching you a Greek lesson here. I couldn't do that if I wanted to. But basically, if you were to look up in a Greek dictionary, what does the word pistuo mean? One common element, and it's the one word that I feel like if you took the word faith and broke it down to a simple one-word definition, it would be the word trust. Faith is trust. But in being comprehensive, there are four components to a saving trust or to a saving faith. The first component is the knowledge of the thing under consideration. This really isn't hard to consider. It's a given. You have to have something to believe in. When we're talking about salvation, as I said before, we're talking about knowledge of the fact that Jesus is the Christ and he has washed away our sins. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, it says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so you have to have the word of God in order to understand and believe in whatever is being the gospel, whatever is the gospel. The second component of a saving faith is mental agreement with the knowledge that's under consideration. We have to mentally agree with the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Many faiths out in the world don't believe that. Uh, unfortunately, Muslims do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They do not have faith in Jesus Christ and many other religions as well, Hinduism, Buddhism, other uh, Eastern mystic religions and so forth. Uh, what we have to get past, though, is the false concept that it stops there, that saving faith is simply the knowledge of Christ and trusting, mentally agreeing with that knowledge. Because in James chapter 2 and verse 19, a very helpful passage that I use quite a bit, it says there that even the demons believe in Jesus and tremble. But are the demons saved? Absolutely not. The demons tremble at the name of Jesus because they know that he is God and they know what he can do to them, but they don't believe in him enough to, and I'm not going to give it away, the fourth component, but just simply to show that mental agreement with the fact of Jesus is the Christ is not enough to save you. James 2.19. The third component is what we already talked about. It's the basic definition of faith. It's trust. And as we showed already in Matthew 14, Peter had a little faith, but he didn't have enough faith. And so you can have, again, different degrees of trust in the knowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. How much you trust in that is going to dictate whether you have saving faith or not. And that brings us 
to the fourth component of a saving faith, and that is obedience. The knowledge that Jesus is the Christ, agreeing with that knowledge, trusting in that knowledge enough so that when the rubber meets the road, you obey Christ. Jesus said on many occasions, the basic principle that he says in John 14 and 15, if you love me, and that would go if you believe in me, then you will keep my commandments. Here's a passage to read to reinforce this real quick. It's in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 18 through 19. And here, the Hebrew writer is talking about the children of Israel walking through the wilderness and how they didn't have trust in God. But this is how it describes the situation looking back. And to whom did he swear, that's whom did God swear, that they would not enter into his rest? But to those who did not obey. Now in the next verse, he's going to say the same thing, but he's going to say it a little bit differently. And pay attention to the wording. So we see that they, the children of Israel, could not enter in because of disobedience. That's what he set up in verse 18. That's not what he says in verse 19. He says, because of unbelief. And so in restating what he already stated in verse 18, they didn't enter the promised land because they didn't obey God, could properly be said because they didn't believe God. And so if you mentally agree with the fact that God is God, which the Israelites mentally agree with that fact, they just didn't trust that fact enough to obey God, turn away from idols, and to enter the promised land which was conditional on those things. And so that gives us a proper view, I believe, of what is saving faith. And it's really, it's really not that complicated, but it's because we've been so perverted by our religious culture in teaching us that just accept Jesus Christ into your heart, which boils down to, when you take the foam off, it comes down to simply having mental agreement in the fact that He's the Christ. But that's not enough to save us once again. Now, if you're watching this, there are two exercises on the notes. Again, there's a link in the description of this video. You can go to a Google Drive document, download the notes, and on pages four and five, there are two exercises that you can do or you can give to somebody else that you're studying with to try to reinforce everything that we've learned up to this point. Because for some people, this is not a given. It's not something they've heard a thousand times. It might even be reorganizing some things that you have believed for your whole life. So those two exercises, the answers are at the bottom. Don't cheat. Don't look at the answers ahead of time. But I did give those answers to you so you could check your answers. And we're actually about to finish up here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through four false views of faith. Now, don't get this confused with what we talked about before. We talked about four false motivations for believing what you believe. We're actually talking about now four false views, four false ideas about the definition of faith. And we'll start off with the first one, which is very common. Perhaps you've said this, perhaps you've heard somebody else say this. They would say, I don't need evidence because I have faith. I've heard people tell that to their children. You don't need evidence, just have faith. When they can't give a proper biblical answer to their children about some question that they have. Let me stress this. Do not tell your children that. If you don't know the answer, just simply be honest and say, I don't know the answer, but don't tell them. You don't need evidence, you just need faith. Because what's going to happen is you're going to send them off to college or just send them off to the real world, and that's where their faith is really going to be tested. And then they'll ask themselves, why do I believe what I believe? And they'll look to those motivations we talked about at the beginning, and they'll think, Maybe my parents were wrong. And if you don't have a good evidence for what you believe, then you shouldn't believe in it. And so their faith goes out the window. They become an atheist or they simply throw Christ out the window and live a life of revelry. There is always or should always be a reason for the faith or the hope that lies within you. And you should be able to defend that. And the idea of I just need faith, not evidence, is not a proper definition of faith. The person doesn't understand what God told us to have. If I told you just by a point of analogy that yesterday I saw Winston Churchill down at the square with a mullet selling wiener schnitzel out of a vending box, would you believe me? The people that are saying, I don't need evidence, I just need faith, would say, absolutely not. You're crazy. They know that because the evidence points to the fact that Winston Churchill is dead, for one, that he was a man of dignity and would not wear a mullet, 
and he was a man of wealth and great stature in the British government and would not need to be seen selling wiener schnitzel at the square in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. And so everything points against that. Why then would you tell your children or yourself that you don't need any evidence, just have faith? That's where blind faith comes in. That's actually the proper definition of blind faith. So the second false view that we'll move on to is the idea that if I believe something with enough sincerity and enough fervency, then that's all right. I'll be good. No. There's a story of Jacob back in the Old Testament. And Jacob, his sons, he had 12 sons, and the oldest sons took out Joseph. At the time, he was the youngest. And Joseph had a coat of many colors. They really didn't like Joseph so much that they sold him to some Midianite traders coming along. And they took his coat of many colors, killed a goat, dipped it in the blood, and they went back to cover up the sin they committed to their father. And they told their father, Father, a wild beast came and attacked Joseph when we found just simply his coat left over. He's dead. And Joseph's crying. He can't believe it. He's so distraught. He believes this with all his heart. His faith in this lie is sincere and it's fervent. And in fact, it affects his life for decades to come until he finally finds out one day that he believed with all his heart a lie. And so how much you believe something doesn't change a lie into the truth. It doesn't change error into fact. It doesn't change blind faith into faith grounded in evidence. That's the second false view. The third false view is simply one that we've already talked about before, and that is faith is mental assent only, not to include faithful obedience. I read one passage to prove that it's not just mental assent. That was Hebrews 3, verses 18 and 19. But let's read John chapter 12 now, verses 42 and 43. This is describing Jesus teaching the scribes and Pharisees. And after he had t taught them, it says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. And so many of them had an agreement that what he was saying, proven by the miracles he was performing, made him who he said he was, the Christ, the Son of the living God. But because the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. They believed Christ, that he was who he said he was, but again, faith is a matter of degree. And because of outside influences, it elevated their doubts and they didn't believe him enough to obey him. Faith is not just mental agreement with fact. It's mental agreement with fact, trusting in that enough to obey when the rubber meets the road. The final view that's false about faith is the idea that we have to have God miraculously give us faith. This comes from the false teachings of John Calvin, <laughs> sorry, John Calvin, who was a reformer in the 1600s. And this doctrine came out as a product of fighting the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church taught that a man can do enough good works, he can say enough prayers, he can count enough bees or something to uh, merit his salvation, to do what was, maybe not even just his salvation, but somebody else's. It's a corrupt, false doctrine. And the Protestant reformers got that part right. They understood that was wrong. And one of the things that opened their eyes to the, the evils of the Roman Catholic Church that they had been deceived under and duped for hundreds and, and a thousand years was brought to light by the translation of the scriptures. And what I'm going to share with you here is just a little bit of history that's very pertinent to why this now doctrine that God has to miraculously change our hearts uh, came out of this fighting the Roman Catholic Church. William Tyndale was born in the age of the Renaissance, a time of resurgence of the study of Greek and Hebrew. He graduated in 1515 from Oxford, where he had studied the scriptures in Greek and in Hebrew. By the time he was 30, Tyndale had committed his life to translating the Bible from the original languages into English. His heart's desire is exemplified in a statement he made to a clergyman when refuting the view that only the clergy were qualified to read and correctly interpret the scriptures. Tyndale said, If God spare my life ere many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow to know more of the scripture than you.
Luther's German translation was the first translation from the original Greek into the common person's tongue in his country of Germany. William Tyndale translated for the first time from the original Greek into the common English tongue. Only three years later, he completed his testament in 1525. 15,000 copies in six editions were smuggled into England between the years of 1525 and 1530. Church authorities did their best to confiscate copies of Tyndale's translation and burn them. After being in prison for over a year, he was tried and condemned to death. He was strangled and burned at the stake on October 6, 1536. His final words were so very poignant, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. These are the types of things that brought out the corruption of the Catholic Church, showing they didn't want the Bible in the common person's tongue because that would show the corruptness of the things they had been purporting for all these years. Men like Calvin went to the total opposite extreme of instead of teaching works of merit, salvation by works of merit, teaching salvation by faith, mental assent, alone, which is actually given to you by God, and so that you don't have to do any works whatsoever in order to be saved. In the middle ground, there is what the Bible teaches, works of faith, combining the ideas that you have to believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and believe enough to obey, which we've talked about already. In James chapter 2 and verse 18, James says something very close to the context of what we're talking about, which seems to contradict what John Calvin taught. It says in James 2 and verse 18, But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Jumping down to verse 22, Do you see that faith was working together with Abraham's works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And there is a perfect marriage between having faith and obeying. That's the point. Well, that's basically the study that I have for you. I'm going to put on, after this study, after the video is over, several questions that are common questions and common, they touch on common doctrines that are believed in America in terms of Jesus Christ, the gospel, and religion. I would encourage you to think about these questions and ask yourself, do I believe in any of these doctrines? And if I do, do I have good evidence for believing in them? Are they backed by the scripture? The next study that we're going to do is a study I've called God and Covenant. Study 2 in the series, Are You Saved? Don't forget, the study notes to this study are in the description link. Download those and start sharing the gospel.